Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. If you're interested in these programs, you can join our membership and our membership is available online at preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Professor Kay Logan Peters. She serves as the architecture and art librarian for the university libraries at UNL. She has held several positions within the libraries, ranging from an entry-level library assistant to department chair. Logan Peters received a bachelor's degree from UNL in 1978 and a master's degree from the University of Missouri in 1981. She joined the library staff in 1982. She has spent over 25 years researching the history of the university. Initially interested in university buildings and campus expansion, she also has developed a website devoted to the physical history and development of the campuses. In August of 2017, her book, The University of Lincoln, University of Nebraska Lincoln, was published as part of the Arcadia Publishing Campus History Series. Please join me in welcoming Kay. And her talk today is titled, The University of Nebraska Lincoln, Its History and Photos. Thank you so much for coming out today. If you can't hear me, if the mic issue is a problem, wave and I'll repeat myself. Um, before I get into photos, which are the fun part of my talk, I want to talk real briefly about Arcadia Publishing and um, what it's like to work with Arcadia and how their series works. They um, focus primarily on local histories. I think most of you have seen them in gift shops and bookstores, and they look like this. They all look like this. Um, they have a few different series within um, their body of publications, and the one that I worked in was the Campus History Series. They were looking for a university person to write a campus history and eventually they got my name. Um, I strung them along for at least three or four years and eventually got around to putting this book together. Uh, they have a very standardized format. There's, there, every book is 128 pages. Every, um, every book uses up to 200 photos. There's a word limit on the captions, which was really challenging for me. You can only use 70 words on a half page photo. I use 70 words, you know, just to say hi to somebody. So that was challenging. Um, there was an overall word limit, which was also really challenging. And um, authors do have the option of writing introductions for the chapters and also a, um, an introduction to the whole work. Um, Chancellor Ronnie Green wrote a foreword for me. That was an option, and I am grateful to him for doing that. And also a bibliography and an index. I intended to do all of these things, but by the time I got to the index and the bibliography, I had no words left. My 18,000 words were gone. So that part I didn't get done. Um, one of the first things I needed to do was come up with chapters. Um, this was part of the proposal. Um, even though they invited me to do the book, I still had to submit a proposal. So before I had really gotten into um, too much photo research or any writing at all, I had to submit chapters. I um, went with a straight chronological approach. I think that was the most uh, easy for people to follow. But as I unearthed more photos, I expanded it a little and included these three red chapters, which are more thematic. The, the chapter on pioneering women has a lot more impact when you see all these stories told together rather than strung out through the, through the um, decades. Okay, um, one thing about photos I should mention, all of the photos in this book with just a few exceptions are from the university archives, which is part of the university libraries. When you're working with Arcadia, you need to have access to a photo collection. They don't um, provide any financial support, support for um, acquiring the rights to use photos. So you need to either own a collection or have access to a collection. 
uh, my colleagues in University Archives generously uh, allowed me to use their photo collection and they'll receive a portion of the royalties if there ever are royalties. Um, the early, early photos of the university are really not that plentiful. You know, there's a, there's a fairly standard group of photos that were taken in the 1870s and 80s. We've seen most of them, but I couldn't really launch the story of the university without recycling some of those photos. So this first photo is, should be familiar to most of us, um, taken from the cupola of the Kennard House um, in the very early days of Lincoln. It's kind of a classic. This is another photo most of you have probably seen. This was taken from um, 11th and O, looking north up to University Hall. I like this photo because it illustrates sort of the reality and the aspirations of Lincoln. We've got the, the dirt street, which you know was a mud street half of the year, um, and these very modest little commercial buildings with the uh, University Hall, which was pretty grandiose for Lincoln, um, at the other end of the block. And here's the University Hall. What a beauty, huh? This building was plagued with problems, um, but it was the university for 15 years. It was the only building on campus. Uh, it sat right in the middle of the original campus, which was 10th to 12th, R to T, uh, basically where the stadium is now. Um, you can see the lovely landscaping. You can see that there was not much else back there. Uh, pretty, um, pretty bleak landscape, really. But everything was in here, from administrators to classrooms. Um, all courses were taught there until the mid-1880s. This photo is, the building opened in 1871. This photo is probably just a few years later. One of the um, decisions I made fairly early on was I wanted to include photos that most people wouldn't have seen. They were unusual, fun photos, and I wanted to focus on, the photos tend to fall into either photos of people, photos of places or buildings, or photos of events. And individually, all of those things, especially places and people, can be kind of boring. But when you find a photo that combines people and events, or events and people and places, then they're really much more fun. But I had to include the chancellors. <laughs> I just felt like the chancellor, headshots of the chancellors were sort of a requirement because they set the tone for these various um, sort of periods in university history. So I had to give up 20 photos to headshots of chancellors and just a few other headshots. Um, this is Chancellor Andrews. I, I actually like this photo because it's taken from a painting, a portrait of him. So some of the photos, I, my, you know, I had a set number of photos. Um, some of them I had to use for, for just sort of basic stuff. And then every once in a while, I found a photo that I just couldn't resist. This um, is John J. Pershing. And he's pictured here with his uh, cadet, some of his, six of his cadets. Um, I stumbled across this photo. It's not a University Archives photo. Um, but the only photos we had in archives were um, headshots, and I was looking for something other than headshots. When I saw this photo, it was, it was identified as being at a different building. And I knew, I knew this building, and I knew that it was Grant Hall, which was a building on 12th Street when 12th Street was still open through campus. Um, so it's taken while Pershing was here. That in itself is kind of special. There aren't very many of them. And it's taken at a, on the steps of a building that I knew very well. And here you can see the, the I'm going to use my pointer. I just bought it for today. <laughs> uh, you can see the panels in the door and the decorative uh, arch there in that doorway. So if we go back to that. But, so I knew where, exactly where that photo was taken because I had this digital scan of the Grant Hall plans. So there you can see the, the doors and the and the trim around the, oops. Okay, I also 
prefer candid shots. I think they're a lot more fun than the studio group portraits. Um, this particular photo has some really key people in it from the sort of golden years of the university in the 1890s. Um, we have, okay, I'm gonna get my pointer again. We have Charles Bessie here, pictured with this group of, of students, along with Lawrence Bruner, who was a student turned faculty member and a very well-known entomologist uh, who worked closely with Bessie. And then this elderly lady here is Ellen Smith. And we'll talk about Ellen Smith a little bit more. Ellen Smith was a notorious character. Uh, she was um, a very early hire. She came in the 1870s. She was feared by everybody, including chancellors. She um, had several jobs. She ran the library at one point. She was the registrar. And when she was hired, she was principal of the Latin school, which was really like a prep school. Students who matriculated at the university, when they got to Lincoln, they, most of them weren't ready because the public schools only went to grade eight. So there was a Latin school, sometimes called the preparatory school, and she was the principal there and apparently ran that with a, with a strong hand. Um, this step that they're sitting on here is also, was also very, very familiar to me. Can you all hear me? Um, it was also really familiar to me from my building research that I did many years ago. So you can see the doorway there. This isn't a, a great photo, but you can see the doorway here has these odd pillar shaped um, with the kind of vessels on them. That's where that photo was taken. It had such key people, I wanted to use that one. And what building is that? That's, that's the original Nebraska Hall, and it sat approximately where Hamilton Hall is now, on the northwest corner of the original campus, northeast. Um, okay, this is a formal portrait, but it's such a great photo because the people in it are so important. Um, these guys are all gathered together to be photographed as members of a group called the Seminar Botanicum, and they were known um, collectively as the Sembot. And the Sembot was a science club. Um, it was kind of an honorary, but it was also sort of a boys club. And it was um, full of, you had to test in, you had to be selected, invited, then you had to, had to pass an exam. Um, and it also had a lot of s sort of ceremonial qualities, which were largely the brainchild of Roscoe Pound. Um, and of course, Professor Bessie and Lawrence Bruner and Bessie's son, Edward, and some of, the, some of these other guys. Uh, and they all went on to do brilliant things. He was Dean of the Medical College this guy was president of the University of Maryland. They, they, were, they, were, they were a really bright group. But Roscoe Pound always had to have introduced some element of fun. So this is a piece that we have in archives that is a hand-rendered invitation for the examination of D. Alton Saunders, who was a potential member, but he had to pass this test. It was, the test was given in 1893 by the Sembot, and then here are the examiners, who include Bessie Pound, Rydberg, and somebody called the LW. The LW may have been um, a person, or it may have been a collective name for the examiners, it's not clear. But anyway, that's a pretty rare piece that I didn't think most people would ever see, so I included it. Um, the Simbot was male. It was 1893, and women at the university in the 1890s and earlier, things were very separate. They were very separate, but there were ambitious women, people like Willa Cather and, and Louise Pound and others were there during those years. Also, in that group picture we saw on the steps of ne Nebraska Hall, one of those co-eds was Mariel Gear. Mariel Gear was the daughter of Charles Gear, and Charles Gear was really the university's first great friend. He um, 
He was president of the Board of Regents for many years. He, he was the editor of the Nebraska State Journal. He was influential and he was very supportive when not everybody supported the university, in the legislature in particular, in the very early years. But his daughter was a student. She was a chemist. She was not allowed to be in the Sambot, so she created the Fem Sambot, the Fembot Sen, which this, this I found in a yearbook, in a university yearbook from the 1890s, so I had a little image made of that. And she's holding her, um, you can see she's holding her cone flower that she's ripped up complete with its roots. <laughs> That's 1894. Going along with this theme of um, separate and probably not equal for the women students, we had the GOI. And the GO, this is another image I found in, in one of the yearbooks. The GOI stood for Go Out Independent. And really up until this time, young women on campus were expected to have an escort a male escort to go to concerts and lectures and any kind of program, certainly if it was in the evening, they needed to have an escort. And when, when Chancellor Canfield joined the university in the early 1890s, he had a daughter, a teenage daughter, and I think he thought, this is just not modern. This is just not, this is just not fair and not modern. So he encouraged the formation of this group, Go Out Independent, so these young ladies could escort each other. They could go to football games or any, anywhere they wanted to go, especially if it was after dark. I had never heard of the GOI, so I thought that was a pretty fun little tidbit. Um, this is a great photo. It's obviously not on campus, but it was taken by um, the man, this man, Erwin Barbour. And Barbour was uh, hired in the 1880s as a geology professor, but his, and he came from Yale, he was very um, highly educated compared to many of our other faculty, many of them didn't have PhDs yet. He um, was interested in paleontology, he founded the State Museum, um, and there were two state museums. There was one before Nebraska, or Morrill Hall. There was a very small one. But he got wind of the fact that there were researchers from Yale and Amherst clear out in western Nebraska in what is now Agate Fossil Beds National Monument. It was on a ranch um, owned by a man named Captain James Cook, who, was, who is legendary in his own right. And they were out at the Cook Ranch um, excavating and bringing home fossils, and Barbour couldn't stand that they were getting Nebraska's fossils. So he befriended Charles Morrill, who was on the Board of Regents, and Morrill funded these expeditions out to um, Sioux County um, for many years, for years and years and years, and then eventually paid for the second museum. <laughs> Um, but Barbour was also an early photography buff, way before most people um, would know what to do with a camera. And it took a lot more stuff, you know, it was more of an investment and it took some skill. But because he was a museum curator, he was really great at keeping track of his images. So you can see down here he's got uh, a, a numbering system. He was a curator, you know, so he was used to taking care of collections. So. He probably took this with a tripod, but he also took many other pictures of campus in the 1890s and um, the early part of the 20th century. The woman, and there is a woman here, right in the middle of the picture, wearing her skirt and no doubt a corset, poor thing. Um, she was Barbour's sister. Her name was Carrie Barbour, and she worked with him. She was an artist. She taught art for a year or two, and then um, was fascinated with fossils switched to paleontology, not something I probably could do, but she became the um, assistant curator of the museum and together they worked at the university for probably 50 years each. She's a very interesting character. This is another Barbour photo. Um, I doubt most people have seen it, of girls playing basketball 
right in the middle of campus in the early 1890s, mid 1890s. Um, you can see, this is Nebraska Hall as well, uh, the south side of Nebraska Hall, so this is right in the middle of campus. This is 12th Street over here. And those are houses on the east side of 12th Street because the university hadn't expanded beyond 12th Street to the, over into the 12th to 14th Street section, yeah. Girl, um, women's sports are really um, an interesting part of the early university's history. They were kind of disorganized. They didn't compete with other institutions. They competed between classes. Um, some years there were a lot of sports, some years there weren't. Their biggest um, supporter came in the person of Louise Pound, who in her own right was a great athlete. She was a great tennis player. She was a bicyclist when most women didn't ride bicycles. She, as she got older, she took up golf and won the city tournament every year till, till nobody would speak to her. She was actually a great scholar as well, and she was a professor in the English department. She received her master's degree from the university, but a woman could not get a PhD in the United States at that time. So she had to go to Heidelberg to get her PhD, came back and then taught in the English department for years and years. There was no retirement, so these people all worked for 50 years. But she was a, was a great advocate of women's sports and an early supporter of, of um, these interclass competitions. And she really wanted to take that competition to a higher level, take it off campus and play the YMCA or Doan or Drake or Kansas State, but that was definitely frowned upon. And her, her nemesis, uh, who we'll talk about in a minute, um, Mabel Lee, later was hired to run the women's PE program and organize these sports, and, and Mabel Lee really did not like the idea of women competing. She thought sports for women should be for health benefits. This is the page from the Cornhusker, where I found the portrait of Louise. And there's also um, this really awful little poem that her students wrote to her. And a thank you for setting up skating, ice skating, and then a, a great picture of the basketball team. So some of these photos I pulled out of other things. What form, huh? <laughs> that looks painful. I'm sure I would break my neck if I attempted this move. This is Ida Giddings. She was the first director of women's um, athletics and mostly physical education classes. And she worked with Pound. She didn't stay around a lot of years, um, but she did have an impact. This particular photo is a Barbour photo as well. And the basketball team. They look like babies here. They're the freshman team who won the tournament. So we can't talk about sports, of course, without talking about football. This, I, I was fascinated with this photo for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it's, uh, it's a candid photo. It's in a location that surprised me, and just the people, the faces of these guys are fairly terrifying. I'm pretty sure some of them are well beyond typical student years. I think the rules about who got to play football, you know, if you kind of showed up and put on the uniform and maybe, maybe enrolled in a course, <laughs> you could be a, on the football team. But Nebraska has had three football fields and the Memorial Stadium sits on the site of the second football field, but the very first football field was right on the main campus. And it, these bleachers that you see over here are actually were on the east side of 10th Street, and this photo is facing south. So you can see these buildings back here, Brace Hall and the original University Library, which is now Architecture Hall. And um, the field was there. Um, Brace Hall was constructed. The footprint of Brace Hall had to be altered because the football field was already sacred ground. It, was, it, it opened in 1906, 
and the it was supposed to be a square building but it was an l-shaped building because this corner was notched out of it to make room for this field i knew this story but i'd never found a photo of it so when i found this photo i i was smitten with it and then it didn't work out anyway the field was only here i think two seasons and then the university expanded across T Street, and that really was the first university expansion, was for the uh, Nebraska field. Here's another gem. Uh, this actually, this photo doesn't belong to archives. It, um, it was purchased at a yard sale by a person who used to work with me in Architecture Hall, and he immediately recognized this structural ceiling because that is this is the main reading room of the architecture library this is this is where my office is now <clears throat> and so he brought it in to show it to me because it it looks the same but it doesn't look the same and after we stared at it for a while we figured out what about it was different we don't have a glass ceiling anymore we have clear story windows, but we don't have that glass ceiling. But we do have windows all the way around the edge of, you know, the, the room is full of light. Well, they had covered them up because this room was typically used for their art gallery and they needed space to display things. In this case, it's being used for the chorus. It was one of the few big open rooms on campus where they could do these kinds of things. This picture is 1923, and this woman is Carrie Bell Raymond, and Carrie Bell Raymond was, was on campus for probably 30 years, and she was director of choral music. She led the university chorus. She led citywide music events. She led the music at the annual Ivy Day festivities, which were held every May Day for probably 75 years. Um, she was very popular. She made chorus a popular activity. Um, here she's just a few years away from the end of her life. This is 1923. She died in 1926 and then in 1932 or three, a building was, the first women's dorm was named in her honor. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't pass this photo up, but it took me two months to figure out what was going on. Um, it had all my favorite things. It had people, places, and obviously some kind of crazy event, but I had to, I had to work pretty hard to find out what it was. Eventually, I, looking through university yearbooks, I found this photo. It was about this big, and <clears throat> it's a game of push ball. And push ball was one of the activities that were made up, invented, for the class Olympics. And the class Olympics were invented mostly by Charles Bessie because student classes kept having these bloody fist fights. So the freshmen and the sophomores would get out on the lawn and beat each other to a pulp. And the, and the engineers and the law students hated each other. They had an annual feud. Um, and I'm not sure the class Olympics actually cured that one, but <clears throat> In the, um, probably around 1910, the Olympics started. And then they started holding the Olympics on alumni weekend. So that's who all these people standing around are. I couldn't, I could not figure this, this picture out. Um, so that's what it is. It's push, it's a game of push ball, which frankly doesn't look much safer than a fist fight to me, um, with the alumni watching the festivities. This is a little later, this, uh, uh, the newer building there, the lower building is Avery, uh, Avery Chemical Labs. And it opened in the after world, right after World War I. And this photo is World War II. So the Olympics stuck around for several decades. I, I included a chapter on student, student, uh, student fun because there are so many great photos like this. This is the Ivy Day Festival. And the Ivy Day Festival started at, which was always on May Day, and it started out as a, an academic event. 
um, in 1900, and it was the day that members of Innocence and Mortar Board, the honorary societies, were selected, and ivy was actually planted, um, but it evolved into, you know, this extravaganza, and Carrie Bell Raymond did the music, and Hartley Burr Alexander designed these ceremonial uh, events, so um, then, of course, there was a queen, there were queens, there were lots of queens and princesses and things like that. But the May Queen was the really big one and the original one. Um, by the 50s and 60s, there were queens for just about everything. Um, and you can see the, the attendants, the little, the little boy attendants, and uh, the structure that was built to accommodate the queen. Um, qu quite, the, quite the deal. And there was Maypole dancing. This is right in the middle of the main, the main old campus, and you can see the building in the background is the original University Library, which is now Architecture Hall. The May Festival died out in the early 70s because um, campus had just gotten so big. There was such, the enrollment was so high that students didn't really know each other anymore, and it, uh, they quit showing up. So. Plus, it was the early 70s, and people just kind of quit showing up for anything organized. So that was when that event ended. Um, the East Campus had its own event called the Farmer's Fair, and this is a photo of their queen. They had a queen, the goddess of agriculture, Ceres, the goddess of agriculture. They had a parade, and they had other events. Um, the campuses were still pretty separate. Students didn't have cars for the most part and um, there wasn't as much cross-fertilization as there is certainly now. Okay, waiting in line, it's part of college, right? This is the same stairway where um, J.J. Pershing and his cadets were standing. This is freshman enrollment, and uh, this picture fascinated me mostly a little bit because of the doorway to Grant Hall, but uh, mostly because of all these great outfits these women are wearing. They're all dressed up. Um, and eager and ready to start college. It's a great shot. Oh, uh, the registration picture is 1926, I think, around then. Um, this fellow was the superintendent of the farm, which we now call East Campus. He took over, the, his name was Senator K, Senator W. Perrin. His first name was Senator. It confused everybody. So he went by Will. Senator Willis Perrin was his given name. So um, he took over the farm in the 1880s, kind of got it cleaned up, got it functioning. It really wasn't a campus yet. It was more of um, a trial farm, kind of. There was a large house there where his family grew up. And um, over the years, he took in kids, boys, who were students in the School of Ag. And the School of Ag was like a farmer's prep school for farm boys. Uh, it didn't lead to a college education or a college degree program. It took kids who were done with public school, maybe 13 or 14 years old, brought them to the farm, worked them for a few years, taught them practical farming, and then sent them back where they came from. So he became known as Dad, and he's, he's part of the East Campus lore at this point. The white um, porch, that nice porch you see from Holdred Street is dedicated to the Perrin family. His wife would feed dozens of people a day, poor woman, and she had four children of her own. And she was feeding some of this mob. These are the boys from the School of Ag showing off their animals with the old barn, the old dairy barn that eventually caved in. And this dairy barn sat approximately um, where the gardens are on the east side of um, the dairy store kind of right there on the south side of the East Campus Library. I didn't include very many photos like this. I could have done a whole book of group photos like this. I included this one because this man, his name was, 
okay, it's hard, M Miller Moore Fogg, Professor Fogg. And he taught the first journalism courses. He was an, ex an extremely popular teacher. But the really miraculous thing he did was started debate and made it cool. <laughs> he had, they were very competitive. They traveled all over debating. They almost always won. He had a certain system for training people in debate, and debate was like a spectator sport. Whoops, oh, I skipped the girls. I can't do that. The girls' track team is another fun story, and they look like they're having a good time here, I think. They, um, they were organized very early, but they weren't allowed to compete in front of men. So after the second field was built, it had a big wooden fence around it, so they would have their track meet every spring behind this wooden fence. But of course, if you tell the guys they can't come, they immediately want to be there. So they all wised up. The women started charging admission. They sold concessions. They got the marching band, which was all male, to march around between events, and it turned into you know the next biggest part, the second party, second only to the May the May Day activities. But this is the 1920s. By this point, their knees are showing. Um, in the early days, they were wearing those bloomer outfits that covered every inch of skin from below the Adam's apple. But here they're practically naked. But they're in a stadium at that picture, right? They're in the stadium. It's right after the stadium is you built. Can see the yeah. Yes. Yeah, they, they held it at the stadium and had, you know, all the all the stadium amenities and it was quite the deal. Um, this is a man named Elvin Froelich. And Elvin Froelich started out as a faculty member. He and his brother were both students, Anton. Elvin and Anton Froelich, and they were Nebraska guys. They um, got their first, their bachelor's and master's degrees here, and then they both went off and got PhDs, and then came back and taught. And Anton died tragically at the beginning of the war in boot camp, but Elvin ended up becoming the dean of agriculture, and he was he he was an East Campus regular for many years. He's pictured here when he's still probably a faculty member with this really incredibly tall corn. Um, I like to acknowledge him because he wrote a history of um, the East Campus. So all these authors that preceded me I like to acknowledge. So I put Elvin in with his corn. Here's a straightforward building picture. I didn't include many of these, but this is Love Library, and this is the view that most of us never saw, um, because the Love North edition was added on this facade. This is facing north, and you can see that it says Don L. Love Memorial Library up here. We, we no longer really have anything inscribed in the building quite like that. But the building is kind of part of the mid-century university lore. Um, The cornerstone was, di was laid two or three days after Pearl Harbor. So they had a ceremony. I don't think anybody looks like they're having very much fun. But of course, that led to the library being used as barracks during the war. Um, as soon as the building envelope was finished enough to be inhabited, soldiers were moved in there. The Army Specialized Training Corps um, moved in. And they were in, in the library building, using it as a barracks, all through 1943 and 44, and then slowly started to leave. The library eventually got in there, but the building wasn't, wasn't really completed and outfitted as a library until a few years later. The war brought just enormous changes to campus. One of the biggest, pro well, there were many problems. Um, in 1945, there were about 5,000 students at the university. And in 1946, there were 9,000. Now, we love enrollment growth, <laughs> but, but that's a, that would paralyze us even now, I think, with a much larger campus and infrastructure. So for faculty, it was really overwhelming. Uh, the physical campus just couldn't contain all these people. A lot of temporary buildings were, um, relocated from, you know, like war, 
war buildings from Hastings were moved in and put on campus. This photo, which is the back cover of the book, is um, the intersection of 12th and R. And apparently, it, you took your life in your hands when you crossed these streets because the traffic was crazy. But one of the biggest problems was that these were adult men. The, these are guys that had gone to war. They had wives. They might have kids. They probably had a car. And the university had absolutely zero parking lots. So parking turned in, into just a major headache and <laughs> continues to be a headache, but it really was a huge problem. So students started showing up and double parking. This is 12th Street. They started double parking and the police came to ticket the cars that were double parked and the students came out of their classes and started yelling at the police for ticketing them. And things got pretty heated and the police ended up using tear, gra tear gas on the students. Things got, you know, kind of crazy and then eventually calmed down. And then it took on this kind of party atmosphere. <laughs> Who knows what was in the tear gas, right? So it turned into kind of a protest slash parade slash party. And it lasted all afternoon and people paraded around campus in a mob and had a good time. Um, you can see in this photo, this is one of the temporary buildings that was um, moved in from Hastings. Um, anyway, it was known as the parking riot. Katie? Yeah. So can you tell us the buildings in that picture? Sure. So you can all get oriented. The building with the scaffolding is, um, okay, Eileen asked about the buildings in this photo. The building with the scaffolding is Burnett Hall, and it's probably under construction, just, just being completed. The building in the foreground, this one, is what we now call CBA, even though business is no longer in that building. At this time, it would have been the Social, Social Sciences Hall. That was what it was called when it was constructed. And then the temp building, this is Andrews back here. And then the temporary building, um, there were four of those right on the green space between Love Library and Andrews and Burnett, kind of right in the heart of campus. And there were many others, and some of them didn't leave for a long, long time, like a decade. So, that's so this is 12th Street going north. Bessie beyond Burnett. And this is Bessie back here. Bessie Hall. The cover of the book is an image from inside the student union in the crib. This was one of the contenders for the cover. I like these photos because they have these great murals on the walls and they show students um, just kind of enjoying themselves at the union. Uh, these windows are no longer, the union has been added onto more than any building on campus and those, un those windows are now, you know, there's an, an addition was put there, so you, there are no longer windows. I, um, I like photos of the campus. I think people like to see how campus has evolved. I think they're always fun to look at. So this next photo was taken from inside the Love Library cupola, looking to the, to the east northeast. So if you study it for a minute, let me tell you what's there. This, can you hear me if I turn, uh, here, I'll do this. This is 14th Street. So this is the corner. Won't be on the mic. 14th Street, the corner of Teachers College, which is no longer called Teachers College. Back here is Whittier. You're starting to, is it making sense? This, uh, these cupolas are on Carrie Bell Raymond Hall, the first women's dorms, which are now called the Nyhart Complex, right on 16th Street, still there. But these, these buildings, and these buildings up here form the north 
east corner of the Selleck Quadrangle. They're a little bit older than the actual uh, main part of Selleck Quad. But these buildings are what interests me. There was a drugstore, very popular soda fountain, um, a diner, um, and then probably housing for junior faculty and lucky students. So this was taken before Selleck was constructed, so probably before 1950. Honestly, it's probably taken when the <coughs> library was pretty new, so the late 1940s. Here's another fun shot of downtown, um, taken from the top of the Teachers College. So this is the corner of Love Library. I, I actually think the purpose of this photo is to show off the library's new landscaping on the south side of the library. Um, you can see there are still some houses um, right there where the Ross Film Theater is now. And then this little white building here. Does anybody know? It's, it's the Tasty in and out Annex. <laughs> it wasn't there very long, but there was a Tasty in and out at that location during these years. And then this, this building that we now call the Gunny's building, or the NRC building, was the Western Electric plant where my dad worked. So I had to throw that one in. I'm going to speed up, speed up here so that we can get through these. Duke Ellington, we had great entertainment, really great entertainment. Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, the Supremes, these were all supported by um, student union programming. Um, and Duke Ellington was the homecoming entertainment in 1957. Chancellor Hardin arrived in the mid-50s, and he, he was on campus a long time. He was chancellor for almost 15 years, and started during the 50s when people were fairly tame, and left at the late 60s when students were incredibly out of, incredibly disobedient. <laughs> this is the uh, demolition of the first Nebraska Hall. And that cornerstone was designed by Charles Bessie. And I'm not sure where it is now, but I would love to, I would love to know. The more things change, right? Here are students waiting to register. The only, the only real change is the location and the fact that the line is co-ed. There were so many students in this era, in the, in the, in the 60s. The baby, the, the post-World War II boom was one thing, but the 60s, all those people had kids and all those kids came to college. And between 1963 and 1969, enrollment went from 10 to 20,000. So it was a huge, huge challenge to figure out where to put all these people. So we started building our high-rise dorms. These are the two that we just recently imploded, Catherine Pound. And others were built. We also built Abel Sandoz, which are down on 17th and Vine. And then these, which are Harper Shram Smith, which were the last of the high-rise dorms. Um, Chancellor Hardin is on the roof of the new Nebraska Hall, which is actually the old Elgin Watch Factory, uh, looking to the northwest. This is a great shot of John Nyhart, Mari Sandoz, Frank Morrison, while he was governor, the chancellor, and then the man in the back with the chancellor. I, I don't know who that is, so if anybody knows. Looks like Terry Carpenter. You think so? Well, I'm going to investigate that, Bob. And they are at the Nebraska Center for Continuing Education, which was one of Hardin's pet projects, um, probably when it was opening. Could be a man from Kellogg, too. It could be a man from Kellogg. Hardin was chancellor when Sheldon opened. We have um, Hardin's wife, Mrs. Martha. Hardin, Norman Geske. The chancellor, Mrs. Sheldon, whose husband and sister-in-law donated the funds for Sheldon. And of course, Philip Johnson, who was the architect of Sheldon, looking tortured. <laughs> <laughs> He, he apparently um, arrived, but Norman Geske told me once he was, a, he was a nervous wreck. He was really uncomfortable with public speaking. You forgot Princess X. And Princess X in the middle, right. Um, 
this is a precursor to Jazz in June. This was taken in the mid 60s. And Stan Getz is up there playing the girl from Impanema. They had already arranged for him to come to campus, and then he had this huge hit, so lucky us. Uh, you, can see, um, you can see Old Grant Hall here and the first museum. Those are north on 12th Street from the gallery, and they were both bulldozed not long after this photo was taken. Norbert Tiemann, governor, one of the university's other best friends, uh, along with the chancellor and Neil Koppel, who was director of journalism, the School of Journalism, and his assistant, Mrs. Emily Tricky. And this was a centennial proclamation. I gotta talk fast, I lost time when we were messing with the mic. So, um, I'm gonna quickly go through these. Barry Goldwater, 1962, the Young Republicans hosted him. And then of course, we had Bobby Kennedy, a few years later, actually this was right after he announced his candidacy, like days later. And it's not a great picture of the candidate, but the sign in the background is just so 1968, I had to put it in there. When Hardin left to become Secretary of Ag, Joe Soshnick took over. And he had been the Vice Chancellor for a long time, but he's the lucky guy who got to deal with student civil rights protests, our, our black students organized and held a peaceful demonstration at the um, admin building for three days at a list of demands. Their demands look, look totally reasonable now, but at, at the time, I'm sure it was controversial. And then the events of May 1970, when the Kent State shootings occurred, like all campuses everywhere, ours kind of erupted. Um, students took over the military and naval science building, and Soshnik negotiated that in a way that there was no violence. Students then protested. Uh, later that same year, they marched from the Union down to the Cornhusker because William Westmoreland, who was General, uh, General William S. Westmore. He was the man on the ground in Vietnam for many years and then became um, chief of staff for the Army. I think this is a great generation gap photo. You know, you've got, you've got this going on over here and then these bewildered looking guys <laughs> in suits. <laughs> we called that the generation gap then, right? Whoops. We'll just do one more. It was not all protests and outrage. We had football championships and Johnny Carson coming to town. This was the homecoming, homecoming between the two championships. Those were the days, right? And Love Library when it was getting its addition. This is my freshman year in college. And then finally we'll look at five living chancellors. This was taken in 1994. And um, three of these people are gone now. But Martin Massengale, who was president when this was taken, and Graham Spanier, who probably wishes he'd never left. Um, so that's it. Thank you. I'd be happy.